At this point, I think it's fair to say that Blender is one of the industry standard tools for doing 3D modeling, and it can do a bunch of other things as well, one of those being video editing. Now, a lot of people don't even realize that Blender can actually do this, and there's a very good reason why it's like this. It's because it's just not very good. Now, that's not to say that it's bad. If you love the Blender video editor, it's not the worst thing I've tried. It's perfectly functional. However, it does have a lot of really weird design decisions that make it kind of odd to work with. Now, if you're used to working with Blender as a 3D modeler, this is actually going to be pretty easy to learn because a lot of the hotkeys are either completely reused or are defined in a way that just makes sense inside of Blender. So let's say they wanted to do something like move this clip right here. Being a video editor, I can just go and click and drag it, but another option we can go and do is I can press G and this will then lock it to my cursor and I don't actually have to hold down the mouse button. And while I'm doing this, let's say that I want to lock it to the Y axis to move it up and down between the tracks. If I go and press Y, that's going to go and do that. And no matter how much I move my cursor to the left or the right, it won't actually move in those directions. And while you are doing actions like moving, it will actually list some useful hotkeys down the bottom here. So if you ever say, forget what they are, then it's pretty easy to spot them. Now, one neat little touch is any mouse related actions will cause the mouse to move cyclically. So let's say that I grab this clip right here and then just drag it off the screen. Now, you might expect that when you see the cursor here, you're actually gonna see the clip attached to it, but that's not actually happening. And that's because basically it's treating this as like the second cycle of the screen and it's gonna just keep moving the clip. And if I go and zoom out now, as you'll see, it's moved it way further along than I could actually see on the screen. And this can actually be really useful in situations like this and with doing things like modifying a property, it's just a nice feature to have in basically any editor like this. Now, my first sort of complaint is when it comes to the interface. The first thing is that for whatever reason in Blender, the interface is tied to the save file rather than to Blender itself. So let's say I wanted to reuse this layout in a completely different file. I would have to then go and remake the layout and remake it for every single file I wanted to use it for, which doesn't make any sense. There should just be a button to say, hey, save the layout, reuse the layout because you probably want to have a very similar layout regardless of what you're doing. There's probably windows you always want to be in the exact same place. Now there is a way you can sort of get around this, and that is by changing the default save file. So when you open up Blender normally, you'll see a cube there and it's going to be in the 3D modeling scene. The reason it's like that is because it's actually loading up a save file that already exists. Now, Blender does provide a way to go and modify this, but if you go and modify it into a video editing scene, then you lose the 3D modeling version, which is not really that great of a solution if I was to use Blender for doing both of these tasks. Also, making new panels in here is just really, really weird. So, the way it basically works, this is the way it works in Blender normally as well, and I still don't like it there, is you go and grab basically the corner here, and you should be able to drag a window out. Okay, can't do it there, because that's actually going to delete the window. Let's try it again. Okay, there we go. Now it actually works. I'm not sure what conditions actually make it delete and what make it create. It's a really weird choice. I don't know why there isn't just a close button and then you just close it like that rather than having both of the functions on the exact same action. And then once you've actually made this panel, if you go and click in the top left here, you can basically set it to exactly what you want it to be. That part's perfectly fine. It's just making and deleting them, which is really weird. But for me, I'm not doing any 3D modeling. So I've just made this layout my default layout and it's basically dealt with the problem. Now, one other thing about hotkeys is because this is Blender, even though some of the hotkeys might be defined in a weird way, basically every action has a hotkey. So if you want to go and rebind them, it's very easy to go and do that. If we go into edit and then preferences and then go to key map, basically we have a list of every single key binding in the entire application. Now, when it comes to doing effects, Blender doesn't seem to have as many effects out of the box as some other video editors. However, it has basically everything that I'm going to need, and for most people, it's probably going to be everything you need as well. So the way we go and add an effect, let's say we want to add it to this clip right here. So click on that, and then if I press Shift A, it's going to bring up this menu here. So let's go and add the transform effect strip, for example. So from here, let's say we want to do a keyframe movement. So if I go to this point right here, add the starting keyframe, and then go to, let's go this point right here, change the value, 
and let's put it, say, there, for example, create the keyframes again. On the dope sheet, we actually have two extra entries, and then over on the graph editor, there's these two extra lines in here as well. The dope sheet is a visual representation of where the keyframes are located along the timeline, and then the graph editor is basically how you go and modify your properties. So let's say we want to go and modify the value of x. So the way we go and do that, right here, this is showing the starting keyframes. Let's go to the ending keyframe. That's going to be way up here. And we have a couple of things that we can go and modify. So let's go and click on this dot here. And we have this line in here. The line is going to change how quickly the values actually change. But the dot in the center is going to change when the keyframe happens. If we move it along the time axis, which is the X axis. And it's going to modify how much is changed if we move it along the Y axis. Unlike most video editors, you don't really have a project directory. You have a place where the project will be exported to. But over on the left hand side here, we have a file picker. So from here, we can go and pick things from anywhere on our file system, not just from a list of files we've loaded into Blender, which in my opinion does make it much, much easier to work with. One other big positive I want to mention about Blender is the way that it does text handling because it's just so much better than every other Linux video editor. I have no idea why they don't all just copy this. So if we go and click add and click add text, it just adds it to the timeline. It doesn't prompt us to save it anywhere on our file system. It doesn't make a PNG of it. It's just right here on the timeline. We can go and modify it as much as we want by just modifying the properties here. We can change the font. We can change the color. We can add a shadow. Basically everything you need to be able to do to font. And it just does it in Blender without going to some weird extra window or trying to save it somewhere weird. It's just better handled here. But that's not to say that everything is better handled in Blender. One of the things that isn't is the audio scrubbing doesn't seem to exist. And when I'm trying to find clips for like the podcast and things like that, audio scrubbing is really, really useful to have. Another thing is that by default, when you import a clip, it doesn't actually display the waveform here. And the waveform is very, very useful to find where there's a break or find where I'm like repeating myself. You can go and enable it by clicking this button right here, but there's no way to go and mass enable it for everything. You have to go and click on one of these, click display waveform, then select everything, then copy this to everything else. And you have to do that every single time you do a project, which is a little bit annoying to deal with. Also, I've had a bit of a bug where the audio quality will just massively drop. Now, it doesn't drop inside of the project itself. If I go and export the project and listen to it in something like MPV, it's working perfectly fine. It's just playing the wrong audio quality in the preview. I don't know how to fix it. I try to restart Blender. It just keeps doing that. And really, the only way I can work out how to fix it is just restarting my computer. So... I don't know if it's a Pulse problem or a Blender problem, but this problem has only ever happened in Blender, so I have to assume it's a problem with Blender. And this right here is a clip from the video that I'm recording right now. So the blue track is the video track and the green track is the audio track. It's supposed to have two audio tracks. The reason why it doesn't is because Blender is hard-coded to only import the first track and there is no way to change this. If I want to have all of the audio tracks, I have to import them separately. And I'm not going to do that because every single other video editor that's worth looking at does it automatically. Now, you may have noticed as I'm doing things like scrubbing through the video and moving clips around that Blender is really, really laggy. And that's basically because Blender is the least optimized video editor on the entire planet. I am running this with a 25% proxy. A proxy is basically when you take a video and then you basically run it at a lower resolution. So 25% proxy is 25% of 1080p. And this is the sort of lag that I'm getting. And if I have it without a proxy, it's actually impossible to use. One of the really weird annoyances with this is you can go and manually set the end of the timeline. So down on the bottom right hand corner here, it shows you a time that shows where you're at. And this number right here is this point right here. Now... I don't understand what the point of this is because I'd want my timeline to end at the end of my last clip. That's pretty normal for a video editor. So what I end up having to do is set this number to some ridiculous number and then when I'm done actually editing the video, I just set it to the end of this clip right here. But even more amusingly, you can actually have clips that go after the end of the timeline. So let's say I set this to like 15,000. I actually can't go and preview any of this stuff because it thinks it's after the end of the timeline. 
Now, luckily in this video, Blender has been pretty stable, but I realized after about an hour or so that I have to make sure I'm saving very, very frequently because the video editor isn't the most stable thing. I think I had about 14 or so crashes over the two weeks I was using it, which doesn't seem like a lot, but I edit my videos in bulk. So over the four days that I edit videos, I had 14 crashes, which can get pretty annoying, especially because the autosave doesn't work. Basically, if you forget to save, just expect that you've lost the entire project. You may have noticed in my recent videos, I haven't had the subscribe animation at the start of the video. The reason why it's like that is because Blender sort of freaks out when you chuck a 60 FPS clip into a 30 FPS project. What it's basically gone and done is kept the audio at the exact same length. But because the video clip is running at 60 FPS, it's actually halving the speed of it to make it match 30 FPS. In the case of, say, like anything else, it will maintain the exact same length and then modify the frame rate. I don't know why Blender's decided to do it like this, though. Being able to snap your clips together is really, really useful, and it doesn't really work consistently inside of Blender. So let's say I wanted to grab this clip here, and I want to snap it to this side or this side here. So let's try to snap it. Okay, it's decided to put it all the way on top of that one instead of right next to it. And here, here it's going to snap fine. Okay. I don't know why it's like that. Sometimes it does it the opposite way as well. So let's see if we can go and force that to happen. Okay, now it's snapping there just fine. And it's not snapping over here. And the last really, really big thing for me is that audio and video tracks are not grouped together. So if I go and say click this video right here, it doesn't actually grab the audio associated with it because inside of Blender, they're not actually associated together. So if I actually want to go and say, you know, cut some clips, the way you have to go and do that is you have to go and highlight both of them and then you can cut them together. And you have to do this every single time you want to do any sort of cuts. Now, there is a way you can go and merge these together by going and making a meta clip. The problem is we don't actually have waveforms now and waveforms are really, really useful and there's no way to enable them on a meta strip. Now, even though I do have a lot of complaints about this, that's not to say that Blender is a bad video editor. It's just that I'd much rather use something like even Caden Live at this point. But it is better than things like, say, Flowblade, and it's worth checking out. The problem is that with the video editor side, a lot of things that really need to be worked on, like, say, importing audio tracks properly, get put on the to-do list, and then never get worked on. That's one thing that could be done very, very quickly, and has been on the to-do list for, I think, four or so years. And I don't expect it to ever be worked on, because Blender is mainly a 3D modeler, and that's where most of the resources are spent on. So if you do want to check this out, Blender is available in most standard repos, and once you've got it installed, all you do is click New Video Editing Project, and off you go. So I think that's going to be pretty much everything for me, but before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald, Michael, Andrew, Nathan, David, Monster, Will, Brennan, Chico Bento, Jamie, Joseph, Mitchell, Peter D, Tony Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. If you'd like to go support my work, then the links down below to my Patreon, Scribestar, LibrePay, all that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over T, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Odyssey, Library, and BitChute if you want to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. Next time, I'm going to be using Olive. From what I've tried out so far, it is actually really good. So until then, I'm out.